Now what I propose to do this evening is to recapitulate to some degree upon what we looked at last week, last time, sorry, from Apocalypse chapter 4, to try and simplify the idea of the cherubim and the seraphim and to try and get it in a more perhaps logical order so that we may all understand. <coughs> now, if we can just go back to Ezekiel chapter 1. Now, obviously we don't propose to look at all the constituent parts of the cherubim because that would be too an extensive study at this moment in time. But Ezekiel chapter 1, in giving us the description of the cherubim, explains to us exactly what it was representing. If we go down to verse 28 of the first chapter, we find as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. And then we find this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of Yahweh. Now, if you come over the chapter and we come through the various points of uh, the opening chapters of Ezekiel, you come to chapter 10 and you will notice in chapter 10 it is speaking again of this cherubim. And we find in verse 4, the glory of Yahweh went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with a cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of Yahweh's glory. And therefore the cherubim had revealed in the opening chapter the glory, the glory of God. But now, because of the chapters which have intervened, that glory was going to depart as far as Israel were concerned. And therefore, when we come from the 11th chapter, and we come down to verse 22, we'll find then, did the cherubims lift up their wings, and the worlds beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. And the glory of Yahweh went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain which is on the east side of the sp city. And afterwards the Spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea to them of the captivity. So the vision that I had seen went up from me. And the vision he had seen obviously as is portrayed throughout these opening chapters of Ezekiel is the vision of the cherubim revealing the glory of God. And that glory, because of the sin and the abomination of Israel, was now departed. And you will notice it was to depart from the mountain, which is upon the east side of the city. Now this was all typical of what was going to happen with Jesus Christ. You remember he was the glory of God in the midst of Israel when he was to go triumphantly into the city, <coughs> riding upon the colt, the foal of an ass, we find that the people said, who is this? And it was reminiscent of what Israel said when they saw the manna. They said, what was it? What is it? And we are told specifically that the manna represented the glory of God. And there was the glory of God revealed in the face of Jesus Christ in the midst of Israel. But of course they rejected him. And yeah. Absolutely. Exodus 16. Exodus 16. Well, let's 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 take you to Matthew. No, let's take you to Matthew 21 first, so that we get the connection. I was only going quickly on that because I thought it's something which you know we're all familiar with, but certainly we'll stop and look at it. Matthew 21 the time when, four days before Passover, he was to ride into Jerusalem, right? And we notice in verse 9, the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who 
is this, right? So they were unaware of the great person in the, in the person of Jesus Christ who was in their midst, right? And so they exclaim, who is this? Now if you go back to Exodus chapter 16, you will see that this was precisely the reaction of Israel when they saw the manna. Now we are told in verse 4 of Exodus 16 that God was going to rain bread from heaven for you. Now we could go to John chapter 6 and other places and find that Jesus Christ was obviously this bread from heaven, antitypically. Right? Now, in verse 7, what they were to see was, In the morning ye shall see the glory of Yahweh. Right? That's what they were told. If you want to read the context, verse 6, Moses and Aaron said unto all the children of Israel, At even, then shall ye know that Yahweh hath brought you out from the land of Egypt, and in the morning ye shall see the glory of Yahweh. Now, if you go up to verse 14, when the dew that lay was gone up, obviously we're now in the morning, behold upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground, and when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, Margin, what is this? Or, it is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which Yahweh hath given you to eat. So the bread from heaven was spoken of as being the glory of God which was going to be revealed. And when they saw it, they didn't see it as what God had provided. They didn't understand it. And they thought, they said, what is it? And that's why it's called manna. Because that's the meaning of the word manna. Now, that's alright. So when you take that forward to Matthew chapter 21, when they looked upon the glory of God the bread from heaven revealed in the person of Jesus Christ they again couldn't recognise it so they said what is it? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Didn't the psalmist refer to it as angels food? He refers to it as angels food yeah. yes uh, in the authorised version that's not what the actual Hebrew says yeah. no, but the Hebrew uh, I'd have to turn it off I've got it noted in the oh. margin but we can turn it up after um, so coming back to, you're right on that one George yes yeah. yes yeah. Well, please do, you know. Please do, you know, I mean, when we look. But coming back to Ezekiel, what Ezekiel was demonstrating was those, that these cherubim were representing the glory of the God of Israel in the midst of his people. Right? And therefore, because of the sin and the abomination, that glory was going to depart from them. And it was to go up from them on the mountain which is on the east side of the city. Now the mountain which is on the east side of the city, of course, is the Mount of Olives. And therefore, because of the people's rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ, he likewise, representing the glory of God at that time, not now in symbol but in flesh, was also going to depart from the mountain which was on the east side of the city. Now you can go through the prophecy of Ezekiel and from chapter 11 the glory does not return until we come to chapter 43. And when we come to chapter 43, chapters 40 to 48 are speaking of the temple, the house of prayer for all nations which is going to be built as far as we're concerned obviously in the future once the Lord Jesus Christ is established and of course the saints are glorified. But taking the thought of Ezekiel, you'll notice in chapter 43 that when Ezekiel was taken round this temple he brought me, verse 1 says, to the gate even the gate that looketh toward the east and notice, behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east his voice was like the noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. Now notice. And it was according to the appearance of the vision which I saw, even according to the vision that I saw when I came to destroy the city, and the visions were like the visions that I saw by the river Kibar, and I fell upon my face. 
And the glory of Yahweh came into the house by the way of the gate, whose prospect is toward the east. Now the visions which he saw by the river Kibar were the visions of the cherubim, because that was the vision of the glory of God. But he'd seen that vision depart. And therefore, in, in type and in actuality, as far as Israel were concerned, that glory has never returned to them yet. And that glory will not return until they look upon him whom they pierced and mourn, and when all Israel has been gathered back into the land through the work of Elijah, and then, in effect, the glory will return to them, and they will become the head of the nations and not the tail. But all we're trying to underline, I mean, it's a fascinating study which we could develop, but what we're trying to underline in Ezekiel is that the cherubim were representing and reflecting the glory of God. Right? Now, last time we saw them back in, in Genesis, in the tabernacle with Moses, in the temple of Solomon, and each and every time they were representing the glory and they were representing the means by which God would dwell upon this earth. And therefore they were the vessels in which God was pleased to dwell. And therefore we took the thought forward that we today likewise should have the vessels in which God is pleased to dwell. And therefore the cherubim first and foremost are representing the presence of God upon the earth reflecting the glory right do we all accept the point now if we go back to Ezekiel chapter 1 the four faces which are mentioned in verse 10 were the four faces we see in Apocalypse chapter 4 the lion the eagle the ox and the man now, these four, obviously, in their own way, are all kings. They're all head of their particular um, um, species. For example, the lion, as we know, is the king of the beasts. The eagle is the king of the birds. The ox is the king of the domestic animal. And, of course, the man is the king of all creation. So, depending on which way we're looking at it, they're all, in their, in their own species, the head one. Now, of course, it's been used very often that these four were used as the standard bearers as far as the four divisions of the tribes of Israel were concerned. That although we've got twelve tribes, they're actually made up of four threes. And we get that in Numbers chapter 2. And when they marched, they marched four square. And you've got the four standard bearers. You've got Judah, you've got Dan, you've got Ephraim, and you've got Reuben. And it's Josephus and others who should tell us that as they marched, they each bore a standard. And the standard was one of the faces of the cherubim. So the lion was the tribe of Judah, the eagle was the tribe of Dan, the ox was the tribe of Ephraim, and the man was the tribe of Reuben. And here we've got the whole picture of the nation of Israel summed up under these four standard bearers. Now what Israel should have been is exactly what the cherubim represented. They should have been the nation upon earth in which God would dwell and reflect his glory and his character. Because then other nations would be drawn to them and they would influence them as far as the worship of the true God was concerned. Now again, if we want proof of this, we can go to the book of Deuteronomy and we can see time and time again Israel were called out to be this special people to reflect the things of God. But of course they failed. Now, these four faces, these four divisions of the cherubim are also used to reflect the four gospel messages. And the four gospel messages give us different aspects of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, as we've got here, looking at verse 10 of Ezekiel chapter 1, you've got the face of the man, the face of the lion, the face of the ox, and the face of the eagle. So the characteristics and the reason for these four um, animals or birds, whatever they may be, were reflecting the different aspects of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see Matthew's Gospel. And Matthew reflects the kingly aspect of Messiah. 
and therefore represented by the lion. And all the way through Matthew's Gospel you can see the king being emphasised. We come to uh, Luke, um, sorry, Mark's Gospel and we find that Mark represents the Lord as the servant, not as the king, but as the servant. And therefore he's represented in the cherubim as the face of the ox. We come to Luke's Gospel and we see the son of man aspect as opposed to the king or the servant we've got the humanity of the Lord being very much revealed by Luke the beloved physician and then we come to the eagle and therefore instead of king or son of man or the servant we've got him represented by the son of God and therefore we've got the eagle being represented in the uh, gospel of John because it's portraying the master in his divine aspect as the son of God now all these only portray one aspect together they comprise the whole and together they are portraying for us the fullness of the Godhead as it was manifested in Jesus Christ so when we come to 1 Timothy 3 verse 16 when he says God was manifested in the flesh justified in the spirit and so on we see it in all its fullness revealed in the gospel message in the face of Jesus now if we come to the uh, second of Corinthians and chapter 4 I believe you will see this expressed by the Apostle Two Corinthians 4 and verse 6 for God who commanded light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts and notice what the apostle says to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us but what God has done is given us the light of the knowledge of his glory in Jesus Christ and therefore when we look at the gospel <coughs> message we can see why the master said he that has seen me has seen the father because he was the word made flesh in him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and therefore what the Lord Jesus Christ was reflecting in his life was the glory of God and therefore he is a fit representative of the cherubim because he was that vessel which God was using to reflect his character and his goodness and his glory right do we accept that do we move on from there okay therefore the next progression obviously is after God has revealed himself through the cherubim in the different aspect we've seen it in bodily form in the sun because it doesn't end there because he's not just called a son but many sons and daughters to glory and therefore the same characteristics which were seen in the master will also be seen in the same community in the age to come and should be albeit imperfectly be seen in some measure in the Christadelphian <coughs> community today as it has been done the ages of time because we are the vessels which God has chosen to reflect his glory to die as we have said many times God has not raised up prophets to die he has not chosen spirit gifted apostles he's chosen us as being the custodians of his truth to reveal his glory and his goodness and his mercy to those in whom we come into contact so to die as it will be glorified in the future the saints are the extension of the glory of God that's why by so many brethren the cherubim are spoken of as representing the saints it's too glib and too loose a, 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 a comparison really it is true but of course it first of all was to represent the Lord Jesus and then the saints each and every stage is reflecting the glory of God right you look puzzled George no you're right you're right with that one right so when we come back to Apocalypse chapter 4 these living creatures as we've already considered in verse 6 and in verse 7 are obviously 
speaking of the cherubim not as they were revealed in the past but as they will be revealed in the future and they will be revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ and the saint community now remember in Numbers chapter 14 verse 21 which used to be a very stock Christadelphian quotation which we don't again often hear today when we are told that as truly as I live all the earth shall be filled with my glory the way that the glory is going to be revealed is given to us in Isaiah chapter 8 now obviously the glory will not just be a shining light which fills this world the glory is mentioned sorry chapter 11 not chapter 8 is mentioned in chapter 11 of Isaiah in the context when the wolf shall dwell with the lamb and so on and so forth we find in verse 9 they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea and you will find that if you go forward that um, it's Habakkuk if you'd like to go forward to Habakkuk chapter 2 he ties the idea of numbers and this from uh, Isaiah together and therefore in verse 14 of Habakkuk chapter 2 the prophet says the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea so it's the combination of the knowledge of the glory of God filling this earth as the waters cover the sea now first of all the glory of God is going to be revealed through whom? firstly of course the Son and secondly the saint community they are going to be the vessels which reflect the glory of God upon earth in the future so that as the master could say so the saints will be able to say you that have seen me have seen the father because the saints are reflecting the very character and the very glory which dwells in the father himself and therefore as far as the, multi the multitude of the nations upon this earth are concerned the saints will be representative of God himself and therefore they will be the glory which is seen but it shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory and of course again it's another one of the works of, of the saint community to educate the people in divine ways in divine ideas so that the people themselves albeit imperfectly but filled with the knowledge of God can be vessels which will reflect his glory so it's an ongoing process as it was first in Jesus as it is today imperfectly in us as it will be perfectly in the saints and then imperfectly in the nations and so at the end of the millennium all sin is uh, uh, removed and therefore all the earth will reflect the knowledge of the glory of God so that God will be all and in all because there will be nothing in which God cannot dwell fully because sin is all removed so when Paul says God will be all and in all that's exactly the state we shall find when the fullness of God will dwell perfectly upon earth and for the first time he will be able to tabernacle with me so that very basically and very briefly is the way the scriptures are presenting the cherubim as being the vessels which reflect the character and the goodness and the glory of God coming back to Apocalypse chapter 4 you'll notice that these four living ones <coughs> had each of them six wings about him now we could go back to Ezekiel's prophecy in chapter 1 when he sees the cherubim and we find the cherubim there had four wings but there was an occasion when six wings are mentioned and that's why we went to Isaiah chapter 6 and where we don't have things called cherubim 
but something which are called seraphim. But you'll notice we're only given one characteristic of the seraphim. And that was in verse 2, above it, that's the throne which saw Yahweh sitting upon it, above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. Now although we give great detail as far as the cherubim are concerned, and as we suggested last time, wherever the cherubim are found, be it in Genesis, be it in the tabernacle, be it in Solomon's temple, there is no reason to doubt, because scripture doesn't give us any license at all to doubt, that each and every time we've got the same figures being represented. Although we're not given all the details in any particular one place, nevertheless, the cherubim which are described by Ezekiel were the cherubim found upon the mercy seat, were the cherubim found in Genesis chapter 3. But as far as the seraphim are concerned, we're given no details. We're not told whether they've got four faces, we're not told what sort of body they'd got, we're not told what the feet were like, nothing about them, except they had got six wings. Now this is the only time in the scriptures of truth the seraphim are mentioned in the aspect of having the six wings. We find that when we go forward, you will notice in your margin, in Apocalypse chapter 4, that the six wings being mentioned there, that's the only connection we have in the rest of the scriptures with the seraphim of Isaiah chapter 6. And you will notice what the Apocalypse does. It puts the six wings on the cherubim. And therefore, the only difference, because the Apocalypse gives us the interpretation, the only difference between the seraphim and the cherubim is one had got four wings and one had got six wings. And therefore there is no reason to doubt that what Isaiah saw in chapter 6 were the cherubim but with six wings. And therefore they're described as seraphim. And therefore in the apocalypse we've got a combination. Now what we're trying to determine is why the difference. Now first of all, before we try and differentiate them, let's put them together. Let's go to John chapter 12, which we looked at last time. Now we came down to verse 39. Right, John 12 verse 39. And while we're just waiting for George, if you'd like to take, go back to Isaiah chapter 6, so you've got the two passages together, so that we can connect the thought very easily. So we're looking at verse 39 of John chapter 12, where we read, Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, and you'll notice in your margin, now in verse 40, is quoting generally from Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 10. He hath blinded their eyes, hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, and be converted, and I should heal them. And so if you go back to Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 10, that's the gist of what we read in that verse. So obviously the Master is speaking in the context of Isaiah chapter 6. And then you'll notice what he says in verse 41. These things said Isaiah, and now he's quoting from Isaiah 6 and verse 1. These things said Isaiah, when he saw his glory and spake of him. So what he's trying to get us to appreciate is Isaiah chapter 6 is speaking about the glory. Now that's precisely what the cherubim were also speaking about, the glory. And therefore the seraphim and the cherubim are linked together because both are speaking of the same time when the glory is to be revealed in the earth. Now obviously, although there is this tremendous connection between them, there has got to be a distinction because one are called cherubim and the other are called seraphim. And yet both are brought together in Apocalypse chapter 4 because the cherubim had got the six wings of the seraphim. 
so you've got the amalgamation of the idea now as we suggested last time the word seraph from which seraphim is derived means to burn or to consume right to burn or to consume whereas the word cherubim or cherub meant to ride or that which was ridden so that's why we suggested the cherub was the vehicle God was using and he was using it as we have seen to reflect his glory and his goodness whilst the seraphim means to burn or to consume now before we look at all the wings and all that sort of thing let's come to Isaiah chapter 30 Isaiah chapter 30 reading from verse 27 <coughs> behold the name of Yahweh cometh from far burning with his anger and the burden thereof is heavy and his lips are full of indignation and his tongue as a devouring fire and his breath as an overflowing stream shall reach to the midst of the next to sift the nations with a sieve of vanity and there shall be a bridle in the jaws of the people causing them to err uh, the point we want you to take the name of Yahweh cometh from far burning with his anger now if we want to take that thought up in the New Testament we can go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and again the idea of vengeance and of fire and of consumption is mentioned by Paul in 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 7 to you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance upon them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and therefore one of the aspects of the work of the saints in the age to come will be to pour out the divine judgments now again those are spoken of in many and varied ways but the idea of it is that God is pouring out his judgment so that the kingdom and nation that will not serve will perish and therefore they are consumed through the fire of his indignation now we're not talking literally we're talking in a symbolic way but the ones who will be the means of administering these judgments are obviously the saints because it is the honour of saints to execute the judgments written it's a well-worn phrase which we've used so often but again if you want it it's in Psalm 149 let the saints be joyful in glory let them sing aloud upon their beds Psalm 149 verse 5 now verse 6 let the high praise of God be in their mouth and a turgid sword in their hand to execute judge, uh, sorry, to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishment upon the people to bind their kings with chain their nobles with fetters of iron to execute upon them the judgment written this honour have all his saints hallelujah so God will pour out his judgment upon the earth through the means of Jesus Christ and the saint community now you'll notice that they have in their hands here a two-edged sword and that is appropriate because there are always two edges to the sword of the spirit and the two edges are mentioned by Paul when writing to the Romans as being one of goodness and one of severity to those who will respond goodness and to those who will not vengeance and judgment and therefore there are the two aspects to the saint community one revealed in the cherubim because they are reflecting the glory of God 
and they will give the knowledge of the glory of God to the inhabitants of this world so that through that means righteousness will be established that's the one sword of the spirit the other side the, the, that's the one edge of the sword sorry the other edge the other side of it is for those who will not respond then he will consume them in his anger he will burn them up and therefore the severity of God will be felt upon this earth both of them are the glory because both Isaiah 6 and the cherubim are speaking of the glory as it will be revealed in the saints so the psalm said let the saints be joyful in glory because it's much the glory of God to restrain sin as it is to educate the nations in righteousness but both aspects will be done by the saint community with of course the Lord Jesus at the head and that's why I believe in the Apocalypse chapter 4 we've got the combination of these two aspects of the way the glory of God has been revealed in the past first of all his character his goodness the four aspects of the gospel message as they reflected the things of Jesus as they reflected the things of God so it will be with the saints as a cherubim of glory the vehicle which he will use to bring his knowledge and his goodness in the earth but the other aspect and therefore intrinsically linked and therefore the cherubim have got to have the six wings we've got the burning aspect the consuming as God would bring his judgments to pass and therefore the six wings are appropriate because six obviously is the number of man and therefore as the four cherubim reveal obviously the goodness of God as the four gospels do the things of Jesus so the six wings depict for us that it's going to be the judgment upon mankind which God will effect but you put the two together and you put four by six of course you get twenty four and therefore there were twenty four and of course that's the priestly aspect again and that was the thought we had from Isaiah chapter 6 because it was in the year that King Isaiah died and the problem with Isaiah is that he was struck with leprosy because he dared to take upon himself the office of the priest and he couldn't because that was of Levi and he was of Judah and it was not right for Isaiah to take upon as king the office of the priest and therefore he was smitten with leprosy but what Isaiah chapter 6 is telling us that in the year King Isaiah died one who will sit upon the throne and the seraphim will reveal those who will be kings and priests not after the order of Levi but after the order of Melchizedek because he was king priest in one man and therefore the saints have been called to be the king priests of the age to come and all the vengeance of God will be in the aspect of the priests because of course they are mediating between God and the people to eradicate sin from this earth now obviously there are many aspects contained in all these developments but that is the basic idea why we've got the combination of the one aspect which is obviously the kingly aspect the glory of God as it will be revealed in the earth and therefore we've got the two aspects of the cherubim the goodness and the severity of God the cherubim and the seraphim so far so good yes right now where I seem to be confusing everyone towards the end because everyone was probably getting a bit tired with the heat the end of verse 8 of the apocalypse this is where I believe we've got a wonderful thought they had six wings about them they were full of eyes within and they rest not day and night we shall come back to those phrases in a minute saying and as the quote you'll notice Isaiah 6 verse 3 holy 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 Lord God Almighty which is sorry which was and is and is to come now if you go back to Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3 you'll notice it's different in Isaiah chapter 6 and yet the difference gives us the answer as to why it must be the same now I've thrown that in because that will confuse George completely notice what it says in verse 3 holy 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 Yahweh of hosts and now the phrase the whole earth is full 
of his glory. Whereas the Apocalypse says, which was and is and is to come. Now you'll notice in your margin, the Hebrew, for the whole earth is full of his glory, is, his glory is the fullness of the whole earth. The Jerusalem Bible says, his glory fills the whole earth. Now we've already seen from Numbers 14, from Isaiah 11, from Habakkuk 2, the way the glory will fill the earth. Through the knowledge which the saints will transmit in educating the people in righteousness, because they will be reflecting the glory of God and educating the people for they themselves to be the vessels in knowledge to reflect these things. And therefore, when the saints have subdued the nation, of educated him in the ways of righteousness, then the whole earth is full of his glory. His glory fills the whole earth. Because we know, Numbers 14, 21, Isaiah 11, Habakkuk 2, that will be the outcome of the education of the people in the knowledge of God. Now, you come back to Apocalypse. And what's that saying? Instead of being, the whole earth is full of his glory, it speaks of him which was and is and is to come. And what's that? The manifestation of God. God was manifest in the past, manifested in the present, and will be manifested in the future. And what did we see in Apocalypse chapter 1 that represented? The Lord Jesus Christ and the saint community. And therefore they will be re represented in the age to come as God manifested. And how will they be? The glory of God revealed in the earth. And so what the Apocalypse is saying is exactly what Isaiah is saying. But instead of saying they are the glory, he speaks of them as the manifestation of God. But it's the same thing. Because they, as the manifestation of God, will be the glory which fills the whole earth. Now the way we try to tie that up, coming back to Isaiah chapter 6, where his glory fills the whole earth, if you go to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18, you will see you've got a direct link by the Apostle Paul who gives us the understanding and the reason we can use these phrases the way that we have. Um, yeah, let's, let's pick up the context so we won't be confused. Verse 18, Ephesians chapter 1. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us ward who we believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come and he hath put all things under his feet and given him to be the head of all things to the ecclesia now this is the point which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all and in all and as the Jerusalem Bible says the fullness of him who fills the whole creation. So his body is the fullness of him that fills the whole creation. And that's exactly what Isaiah chapter 6 is said. When the glory fills the whole earth, it will be filled through the body who will fill the whole earth with the fullness and the glory of God. The body is the fullness of him who fills the whole creation. And therefore it will be the body, the ecclesia, the saint community with the Lord Jesus Christ as the head, who will fill the whole creation as the fullness of him reflecting his glory and his knowledge in the earth. Anybody like to comment? Any queries? Let's explain it a bit better. No, the, the, the point which you just been saying, I had a problem 
that haven't come for years. Yes. In the fact that it said to be filled with the knowledge. Yes. And I understood. I may have got this wrong. I've got a little bit of doubt now. But when I looked at it once, I, I was under the impression that the word knowledge is the same basic word as Eve when Adam knew his wife. Yes. And that was having then an intimate relationship. With yes. Them. And the problem that I had with Habakkuk was that I didn't see how that could come to pass until God was all in all. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really think that Habakkuk chapter 2 was referring to that age, it mm. was referring to the, into the millennium. Yes. So somewhere along the line, I think I've gone astray somewhere, but I don't quite know where. Well, you see, the, the perfect state can only be at the end of the millennium. Yeah. But it's the same as the knowledge of Jesus Christ to us to die because we are filled with knowledge we are filled with the things relating to God and the things of Jesus Christ just hang on a minute right and therefore we are now the vehicles in which God desires to dwell that we may be the reflectors and the carriers of his character and his goodness to those who we have to do with Therefore, imperfectly, the knowledge of the glory of God dwells in us to die. Yes, but does the word knowledge as facts rather than as the intimate relationship? Yeah, but it will be intimate. It is intimate, isn't it? Because we've come to know well, him, uh, yeah. the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. You see, it's to learn, isn't it? By experience. We, we, we haven't got that full intimate relationship until we become bright. Precisely, but we have in an imperfect state. It is the way he speaks of us. Because when he speaks of us as being the temple of the living God, I will dwell in you. Yeah. Right? Now he dwells in us now as far as the light of the knowledge of his gospel dwells in us. As far as we represent his character, he dwells in us. Now it's obviously because of the things that we do totally imperfect and we are totally unworthy of such a high calling and therefore Paul says we have it in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of him not of us and therefore it's God manifest in us that is the whole point of it it's not that we have taken upon ourselves the glory because we can't but that he has shone the glory through us because of the, night, the knowledge of the gospel of, of Christ now, when you think of that in the age to come, when we are not learning purely from the word as we are to die, but the saints will be the instructors of the word, that they will be able to take the gospel of that age, right, and instruct personally the mortal population, and when they will be able with signs and wonders to demonstrate the power which is there, when obviously a sinner you know, sh sh a child shall die a hundred years old. There's only go obviously going to be a longer lifespan than we have today because sin's going to be restrained. So we're going back to the Edenic type of uh, life and, and lifestyle. And, and therefore, when the nations of the world are educated into the knowledge of the glory of God, they themselves, imperfectly, but certainly perhaps more perfectly than we are today, will reflect the knowledge of the glory of God. The Lord Jesus will do perfectly, the saints will perfectly, the nations will imperfectly until the end of the millennium when God will be all and in all perfect. But there will be a fulfilment of Habakkuk and Isaiah and me in the knowledge of the glory of God being seen in the earth. It's a marvellous progression of thought, you see, because God is manifest, first in the Son, then in the same community at the first resurrection, and then in the nation through the millennium to the second, when God will be all in all. You see, it's a progression of thought all the time. God manifests. And that's the only way the knowledge of the glory of God is going to be in the earth. You see, it's not, you know, it's not anything airy-fairy. You know, when, when they saw the, the glory filled the tabernacle and they saw a blinding light, that's not going to be what the kingdom is. It's not going to be a blinding light, you know, from the four quarters of the earth. It's going to be the saint who have educated the people in righteousness. They will then be, with the saint, the knowledge of the glory of God throughout the earth. Marvellous sort. Okay. Right, let's just, um, we've got a few minutes, Charles. Uh, 
let's just reflect back to verse um, 8. You'll notice they were full of eyes. Full of eyes. Now, of course, the angelic being have been the eyes of God up to the present and also until the time when the kingdom is established. But in the future, of course, it will be the saints who will be the eyes, the all-seeing presence of God in the earth. And that's exactly, if you'd like to make your quotation, what Zechariah sees in vision in chapter 4. It's under the symbol of the golden lampstand with the seven pipes to the seven lamps and so on and so forth. You see then in verse 10, Who hath despised the day of small things, for they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of Yahweh which run to and fro through the whole earth. Now, at the moment, as we have said, the angelic being are the ministering spirits. They are the eyes of Yahweh by which he is all-seeing, omnipresent. But in the age to come, obviously, it will be the saint community who will be the eyes as they go forth, all-seeing, all-powerful, with the knowledge of glory of God. And therefore, we would expect that the cherub cherubim stroke seraphim would be full of eyes. But then you'll notice a lovely phrase in verse four, um, 8 of the Apocalypse, chapter 4. They rest not day and night. Now obviously, as we read about God himself, he that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. And therefore, with immortal bodies, like unto the divine, there will be no need of rest. And therefore, it will be a continual service. And of course, that's precisely what the tabernacle was. It was a continual service. We go back to, uh, to Psalms, Psalm 134. Psalm 134, verse 13. And there, one of the songs of degree, verse 1, Psalm 134, Behold, bless ye Yahweh, all ye servants of Yahweh, which by night stand in the house of Yahweh. Now we'd expect them to be there in the day, but that they're also in the night. And the idea of it is it is a continuous service. It never stops. It doesn't have holidays or breaks or, you know, sleep or anything like that. It is a total continuous service. And so that will be the effect of the same community in the earth. It will be continuous there will be no day nor night as far as the activities in the uh, service of the truth are concerned. Obviously the mortal population will have to have rest, but we're talking here about the cherubim, stroke seraphim. They rest neither day nor night. They are constantly working on behalf of God. And so, coming back, chapter 4, verse 9. And when those living ones give glory and honour and thanks to him that sat on the throne which liveth for ever and ever and of course we've seen back in chapter 1 that the master describes himself as the one who was dead but is now alive forevermore he's the one who is sitting upon the throne to whom the saint community will give the glory and honour and thanks which is due to his great name because he is God manifest the 24 elders the priestly aspect also now fall down before him that sat upon the throne and worship him that liveth for ever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, the symbol of homage, the symbol of bowing to the one who is greater, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And there's all sorts of people who make all sorts of things about verse 11 and try to make it as complicated as they can, saying, how can it be Jesus Christ who is sitting upon the throne if it is spoken of the one who has created all things? Now, it's very simple to be able to determine this from the word. But first of all, you'll notice that phrase in verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord. Now you can look in any other translation and you will find 
that rather than saying thou art worthy O Lord the revised version for example says worthy art thou our Lord our God the diaglot says thou art worthy O Lord even our God the Jerusalem Bible says you are our Lord and our God you are worthy of glory and therefore rather than speaking of just saying thou art worthy O Lord in the Greek we've got also God mentioned worthy art thou O Lord our God and you might say well that makes it worse but it doesn't it makes it a, a lot easier to understand come back to John chapter 20 and you remember the phrase which Thomas uses when he sees the resurrected Messiah the one who had doubted because he said I'll not accept on that I put my finger in his hands and put my hand in his side and so in verse 27 John chapter 20 the master says Thomas reach hither thy finger and behold my hands reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless but believing and Thomas answered and said unto him my Lord and my God and that's exactly what the saint community are exclaiming to him that sits upon the throne my Lord and my God now of course the Trinitarians would have us believe that he was saying it's my God because of course he was the second part of the Trinity but of course rubbish absolute rubbish what Thomas was there saying is something which is taken up here in verse 11 of the Apocalypse chapter 4 Thomas was speaking of both aspects of Jesus Christ my Lord because he was the son of man he was Lord over man but he was saying my God because he was son of God also and therefore what Thomas was exclaiming was that he the Lord Jesus Christ was not just his Lord because we have many Lords he was not even the Lord in other words the supreme one over man but he was his God also because he was God manifest not because he was Yahweh himself of course not but as far as Thomas was concerned he saw in the resurrected Messiah the perfection of the Godhead bodily and therefore he saw him as God manifested in flesh and that's exactly what we've got in verse 11 you remember when we look back to verse 3 Apocalypse chapter 4 why does it describe the one sitting upon the throne as the jasper and the sardine stone because we saw that one spoke of his flesh the other spoke of his divinity and therefore he was representing the fact that God had been manifested in flesh and we saw that perfectly did we not in the jasper and the sardine stone so if the one spoken of as sitting upon the throne described as a jasper and sardine stone as being God revealed in flesh no wonder the saint community will say thou art worthy O Lord my God because it's the combination of the two ideas as the Father has been revealed perfectly in the Son and therefore they say for thou the one sitting upon the throne the Lord Jesus Christ has created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created what things have been created go back to 2 Peter chapter 3 how many seconds have I got Charles? One minute. Right. We'll just wrap it up. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 13. I'll just put this for the uh, those who take the tape. 2 Peter 3 verse 13. Isaiah 65 verse 17 to 19. We'll look at them uh, afterwards in discussion. And what we are looking for is the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness and who will be the creator of the new heavens and the new earth who will be the creator of the kingdom of God upon this earth Jesus Christ and therefore he is exclaimed as being the one who has created all things why? because all power has been given unto him in heaven and in earth Matthew chapter 28 and it will be Jesus Christ who will create the order of things which will be found in the millennium and for thy pleasure 
They are and were created because all power has been given to the Son and the Son will create all things and therefore for his pleasure as God's creation in the uh, days of Genesis were created for his pleasure. So the saints give glory to him who has created all things. It's a wonderful thought and therefore we can conclude in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15.